What up, gang? It's Ken Zerk, Ken Zilligan, Zika Milligan, and Villa 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 We are back on Tsukihime. Ah, uh, wow. Shit. Last episode. Holy fuck. Ah, uh, holy fuck. Holy fuck. Last episode was fucking insane. Holy shit. I don't really know what to say. Um, this shit was just crazy. Like, we was chilling, talking to our bro, our old girl, all of that. And then we just murdered somebody. I'm, you know, like, I guess casual shit like I I don't know is that casual shit is that something that just happens we're on day three the black beast one apparently I'm in the, the seal route which is fine you know I, I, I think I told y'all in the first episode like I wasn't gonna be doing any specific route for my first playthrough I was just gonna you know just kind of play it choose what I think is the right choice and see where it takes me and i'll go back and do the actual routes next time i'm pretty sure that's what i said so i guess i guess we're down the shield route so let's just see how this works out we're home no we're not home we're in seal's house mm. the sunlight streaming through the window wakes me maybe the rain stopped i can't hear it anymore it seems the sky outside is cloudy. The sunlight isn't what you'd call bright. Huh? I look around. This is obviously not my room. <laughs> ah, good morning. Did you get sleep well? Did you sleep well last night, Tona? Ah. I remember now. This is Senpai's room. I have borrowed her bed for the night. Ah, yeah. Good morning, Senpai. Becoming extremely embarrassed, I hop off the bed. Sorry about yesterday. I caused you all sorts of trouble and... Yes, you owe me one. Senpai replies with a smile. How do I put it? She seems very mature. Anyhow, thanks. I'll be going home now. Oh, really? It's barely six o'clock, Tona. Yes, but I didn't get permission to stay the night away from home yesterday, so... If I don't hurry back to the mansion, there's no telling what Akio will say. Ah, uh, your little sister? Well, I've already called her, so it should be okay. Senpai delivers her earth-shattering statement with a casual air. Wow, okay. What, you called my house, Senpai? Yes. I thought it wouldn't be right if I didn't contact them about you staying over. Is that a problem? What? Uh, I'm at a loss for words. Seal Senpai calling my house means a girl has called my house saying Tono is staying over my place. That's, well, yes, it's a problem, a big problem. If Akia had been the one who picked up the phone, she's gonna think I'm some kind of playboy. Given the severity of the Tono household, I don't even want to imagine what would happen if she found out that sort of thing. Tono, did you really hate staying at my house that much? No, that's not it. It's just that my house is really strict. It's definitely not because I don't like you, senpai. Flustered, I try to explain the misunderstanding. Senpai closes her eyes, sadly. Is it because I caused her so much trouble last night? I feel so bad when I see her make an expression like that. I'm telling you, that's not it. I'm really grateful to you, Senpai. Feeling, I'm feeling much better now, and if you hadn't been there for me last night, I don't know what would have happened to me. Yes, you're right. You look like you're back to normal now. I don't know what happened last night, but I'm glad you're feeling better. Suddenly, Senpai gives the biggest smile anyone could possibly give. I was just joking. Even I wouldn't directly call your house. I asked Inui to call your house and tell them you were staying with him last night. There should be no problem with that, right? Yeah, that should be no problem. But that was kind of a mean joke, Senpai. I thought my heart was going to stop. Yes, I'm actually pretty mean. Pick on the ones you like, right? Huh? Ones you like. Hold on. Hold on, what that mean? Hold on, what that mean, Seal? Hold on, what that mean? But it's true you should go home early. Please, hold on for a second. Senpai rummages in her drawers for something. Here you go, Tono. It's a little gift for you. Saying that, Senpai hands me an old looking ring. A little gift? What is it, Senpai? It's a protective charm. 
You seem to be dangerously spaced out a lot, so please hold on to it. Uh, yeah, I'll take anything that's given to me, but all right. I'll take good care of it. Accepting the ring, I put it in my pocket. Nigga, put it on your finger. She just proposed to you. Are we married now? Ah, uh, I, I hope so. I love her. All right, I'll see you at school. Senpai sees me off with a smile. But that smile is one I might never see again. What does that mean? Oh, oh yeah, the police. I forgot. Okay, I was about to fucking say, like, are you, like, are you? Did you kill her too? <laughs> the woman I killed might be found already, and the police might already be at the mansion. But I can't run away from it. All I can do is thank Senpai and return to the Tono Mansion. To say the results first, the mansion is as it always was. Ah, oh, welcome home, Shiki. As I enter the lobby, Kohaku greets me with a smile. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm home. I'm Kohaku. Ah, uh, do you want breakfast? I'll have it ready soon, so please wait in the sitting room. Akiya has just finished hers. Kohaku patters off toward the sitting room. It's too peaceful. Maybe they haven't found the body yet. For now, I head toward my own room, room from its fort to room. Fuck! Room to change. Hisui is in my room when I return. Good morning, Shiki. It seems you have returned. Yeah, just now. Listen, Hisui, do I have a spare uniform? The one I'm wearing now is soaked from yesterday's rain. I understand. I will have one prepared immediately. Hisui bows and silently leaves the room. After changing into the uniform Hisui brings me, I head toward the sitting room. A disappointed looking Akiha is sitting on the sofa in the sitting room. Oh, good morning, Ni. Nee. Good morning, Nissan. It seems you have returned. Akiha's voice contains storms filled with blame. Yeah, good morning. Look kind of grumpy this morning, Akiha. Yes, I was unaware you might spend the night elsewhere quite often. I am more astounded than angry. Akiha glares at me. Uh. It's true I spent the night somewhere, so I can't argue. Well, I suppose there's no helping it if you weren't feeling well. The one called Inui is your friend from middle school, isn't he? Yeah, I see. So he was the one that called you. Suddenly I feel uneasy. Just what did he say when he called my house? Besides, even if you had to leave school early, you could have just called me and I would have sent a car to pick you up. I don't know why you are so reserved, but you are the eldest son of the Tono household. Please, use everything, everything at your disposal. Besides, your body is weaker than that of a normal person. Ah, uh, oh yeah, I left school early yesterday. To collapse from anemia just by getting soaked from the rain. Are you not feeling well? Shall I have the family doctor examine you and send you to and from school and in a car from now on? I see. So that was the reason I was supposedly staying at Arahiko's house. It's nothing for you to worry about, Akiha. I go to the hospital once a month like, like I'm supposed to. Taking me to school by car is just going to dull my body even further. There's no need for you to be that sensitive about my body, though I'm glad you're worried about me. That's not true. I'm not worried about you at all. Akiya subtly avoids looking at me. Shiki is ready. I hear Koaku's voice from the dining room. Right, so I'm going to get some grub. I fucking hate that word. Oh, Nissan. Please, refrain from talking in such an unrefined manner. Akiya shoots me a sharp glare. Ah, uh, you're acting normally again. That's how you should be, Akiya. You don't have to worry about me, so just relax. You're so persistent. I am not worried about you. Akiya quickly looks away. Looking at her with a faint smile, I go to the dining room. Fuck you mean don't talk. I talk how the fuck I want to talk, ugly ass. Please, take care. Saying the same thing as she always does, she continues to stare at me. Stare in my eyes, your eyes so divine. I feel so sublime, feel this way all the time. Hold on, hold on. Feel this way all the time in the light of my dreams. It feels so serene. Seeing you next to me, 
Seeing you the best of me, giving you the best of me. Hold on. I might not be able to freestyle rap, but maybe I can freestyle R&B. Maybe I can freestyle R&B. Hold on. <laughs> Ken Zerk with the freestyle R&B. Hold on. I'm sorry. Shiki, what happened to you last night? Nothing in particular. I collapsed from anemia when it started to rain on me. I'll be careful from now on. I'm not placing any blame on you, Shiki, but you look like you are pushing yourself this morning. Please take care along the way. Hisui makes a deep bow and sees me off. Oh man. I tried to act as normally as I could, and although I didn't give myself a, a way to Akiha and Kohaku, it didn't seem to have worked on Hisui. I wonder if Hisui is worried about me. It's hard to tell when she looks so disinterested all the time. Today might, might be my last day of school anyway. I'll try to spend it as I always do so I don't have any regrets. No matter how I feel, the morning is always the same. As I approach the school, I begin to catch sight of more and more students in uniform. It's Saturday, right before the day off. My footsteps falter as I think about how this may be my last day at my school, my last school day ever. But still, as calmly as I can, I walk along the road that's become so familiar to me over the last two years. It's only a little way to school once I pass this intersection. The light turns red and I stop in, and I stop in front of the crosswalk. The school fence is on the other side of it. Since it's a school path, the footpath is protected by a guardrail. Even now, the students in front of me are heading, to, heading towards the school gate. There's no one but students from our school on the other side at this time of day. There should be there should be no one but students. But between the cars rushing by, I feel like I catch a glimpse of someone in white. The fuck? Hold on, what? What? I'm gonna be honest here. Look, it might it might shock you guys. This might shock you guys, all right? This might like shock you, confuse you. You might be like, no way, this isn't possible. But I'm gonna be honest, okay? I'm confused as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I know, like, Zeke, you have superior intellect. You're like Magneto mixed with Victor Von Doom mixed with Richard Reeds. How are you confused? Nigga, I am confused. I swear we chopped this bitch into fucking chicken breast meat. How the fuck is she still alive? What the hell? What? She is there, dressed in white, with golden hair down to her shoulders, long, slender brows and red eyes. I've seen her only once before, but there's no way I can mistake her for someone else. But that's impossible. I killed her myself yesterday, cutting her into pieces. The light turns green. The students around me walk towards the other side. I'm the only one amongst them who stands there, stunned. She sits on the guardrail, her legs swinging idly, as if she's waiting for someone. I can't tell how long she's been waiting, but her expression isn't a grim one. Who is she waiting for? She fidgets there, she fidgets restlessly, as if she were waiting for her lover. I have a bad feeling about this. Ah. The girl in white looks over in my direction. It's probably nothing more than a coincidence. She's just a stranger who looks like her. She must be waiting for someone else. If not, then this moment must surely be a bad dream too. After all, I've completely and utterly killed her with my own hands. But she's looking this way and smiling, looking very satisfied at having found the person who killed her. Her smile seems to say, you finally come. Giving a familiar wave and smile, she hops off the guardrail. Fluttering her hair, she heads towards me. Don't come. This is a bad dream. The light turns red. Don't come near me. She doesn't even look like she cares, walking straight across the street while the cars pass by. There's only a few meters between us. I'm, I'm telling you not to come! The reality before my eyes is not change even when I scream out. Screaming in a voice even I don't understand. I run from the girl in white. I run. I run with all my strength. With no regard to embarrassment or shame, I blast through the passerby. Passerby, running full speed across the asphalt. 
My breathing is wild and my heart screams out, but still I run. I feel like I'm going to go crazy if I don't. I look behind me. The girl in white is walking towards me. She's definitely following me. The girl I've killed is chasing me. That's more than enough reason for me to run. My heart feels like it's about to explode, but I ignore it and keep running. When I look back, the girl's still there. With those light footsteps, she follows me as I run away. Oh my, my head droops down. My arms feel heavy. My legs feel like they're about to tear off. But despite that, I'm running with all my strength. And yet, I can't get away from someone just walking after me. My breathing is out of control. Think I've already run seven kilometers. Damn, nigga! But even so, when I look back, she's always there, walking towards me. Is this bitch Jason Voorhees? Is she Michael Myers? Is this bitch teleporting and shit? Naturally, like she's taking a stroll, she follows right behind me. <laughs> it's not funny, but I begin to laugh. <laughs> Stop laughing. But even so, I run. My body complains that I'll die if I run anymore. But I keep running. The reason is simple. If she catches me, she'll kill me for sure. I ask myself what I base that on, trying to shake it off as mere imagination. But even as I try to console myself, I'm the one who knows best if it's true. There's no reason, no basis, no evidence. I already know that if she catches up to me, I will be killed. Ah. Pathetically, I collapse to the ground. I fall forwards. Not because I tripped, but because I simply can't move my body a single step further. Ah. <sighs> Lying there, collapsed, I somehow managed to crawl my way to the wall. I try to pull myself up against the wall, but it's no good. My knees lose their strength as I try to rise and I collapse back down. My body won't move anymore. <clears throat> I look up as I breathe. It hurts. I don't have enough oxygen. I can't think properly because of it. I can't even tell what I'm doing anymore. I don't know why I'm doing this. Why? Why? I don't even know why the girl I've killed is alive. Unmistakably, I've utterly and completely killed her in the most final way imaginable. So why? How can she be waiting for me in front of my school, smiling? I'm sure I killed her. That's right. I'm sure I killed her. I'm sure I killed her. I'm sure I killed her. I'm sure I killed her, so why, 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 why? Oh, is the chase over already? With light footsteps, she comes into the alley, shrugging her shoulders in disappointment. Hello. You really gave me some trouble yesterday. With a warm smile, she comes into the alley. I've got to run away. So thinking, I retreat, only to hit my head against a concrete wall like a dumb fuck. The chase is already over, right? This is a dead end, after all. There's no need to worry about anyone coming along or interfering. She smiles, looking very happy. Ain't shit to be fucking happy about? The fuck? Panicking, I look around my surroundings. A desolate alley. I'm disgusted at how stupid I am. To run away here is like asking her to kill me. It's been a long time. 18 hours since then, I finally found you. She takes another step into the alley. E you. What? I definitely, yes, I'm the girl you killed yesterday. I'm glad you remember. That's gotta be a lie. There's no way that can happen. Don't be ridiculous. Dead people can't be alive. That's true, but there's no need for you to be so surprised. I just revived, that's all. With that curt response, what the fuck? Vampire bitch? With that curt response, she takes another step. The sound of it reaching my ears. The distance between us is gradually decreasing. Revived. Stunned, I repeat her phrase back to her. Revived. You mean some doctor saved her with some surgery? Nigga, no. Don't be stupid. 
There's no way any human can survive revive from being cut apart like that. Yeah. Then again, I'm not human. Huh? Her words are so simple. There's no way I could have misinterpreted them. I'm not human. That's what the girl in front of me said. You're not human. Jeez, isn't that obvious? Do you think that's a human out? Do you think there's a human being out there who can revive the being cut up into pieces? Are you fucking stupid, nigga? There's no way a human like that could exist. Something like that is just a monster who looks human. Something that revives even when killed. Something that death is irrelevant to. Something that quickly returns to normal and starts moving after being, even after being cut to pieces into something you can call a human. N no way. That seems to be the girl right before my eyes. I try to laugh, but my throat is so dry I can't. What in the hell is that? It's not exactly a funny story. Besides, there's too many things in this story that aren't funny. Because definitely, if she's not human, it explains why she explains why she's alive even after I've killed her. I start to calm down. This is a situation where I've got to observe everything and think it over. You said you're not human. So what are you? Me? I'm called a vampire. I was joking. I was joking. To put it in your terms, I'm a monster who lives off human blood. That's good. Vampire is at least something I can easily understand. I see. You're a vampire. She smiles in satisfaction to indicate her assent. What a crazy reply. I've heard that vampires can't walk around during daytime, but I guess that's a trivial matter right now. So what does this monster want from me? For some reason, she recoils as if surprised. After a moment, she puts her hands on her hips and looks at me, irritated. Have you forgotten what you did to me yesterday? Even though you didn't know when you cut me apart the moment we met. You've got to be pretty used to this to ask me what I want with you now. She looks more disgusted than angry. I would be too. How the fuck you gonna take that attitude with me after you fucking murdered me, asshole? But right now, that's how I feel too. Because someone I've killed is complaining to me about killing her. Hey, are you listening, murderer? Yeah, I'm listening. Sorry, could you shut up for a minute? I'm reflecting on how unlucky this is, even for me. Sheesh, I have the worst luck. There was a girl I wanted to kill for no reason and I killed her on pure impulse. I agonized over it in deep despair. And even though I firmly decided to atone for my sins, the one I killed appears out of nowhere and says she isn't even human. <laughs> I can't help but laugh. It's not all bad. If the person I killed has come back to life, then that means I haven't actually killed anyone, right? Well, I suppose the fact remains that I killed someone, but she's still alive. And that's something I should honestly be happy about. Yeah, with this, I should be able to get back to living my normal life. A normal school life, just like I did up until now. Well, in exchange, I seem to have been cornered by this strange person. But you might argue it's a heck of a lot better than becoming a murderer. Okay, I I've calmed down. If you got something to say, I'll listen. Complaints, grudges, whatever. Talk all you want. Yeah, I've got a whole lot of things to say to you, but you're weird. I'm just taking everything in right now. You could say I've built up a resistance to weird stuff like this. I don't think it's of much help in this case, though. Hmm. She stares at me. It isn't malicious. It's strange. I thought to... I thought that I thought that to get someone back when they got you was one of the common laws of the world. That she should be trying to kill me, but what are you staring at? You're here to get revenge, right? Then Yeah, I guess I'm supposed to kill you back, in theory. I'll kill you if you really want me to, but otherwise I'll pass for now. It's not really a vicious it's not very efficient that way. She stares at me head on. So are you sorry? Huh? I'm stunned for a moment. The things she says are so out of place. I'm asking you if you're sorry for killing me. I'm thinking about forgiving you if you are, you see. Besides, I get the feeling you're a pretty bad liar for a human. 
Sorry. Me? Yet? If you apologize to me, then I'm fine with that. This is unbelievable. What's so unbelievable? Oh, no, what's so unbelievable? Not that the person I killed is forgiving me, but her voice sounds so kind. Hey! You have to give an answer when people ask you seriously, you know? Come on, hurry up and answer. We can't get on with things until we make it clear whether or not you're sorry. She's angry. Am I sorry, she asks. That goes without saying. Yeah, I regret it. No matter what the reason is, I did kill someone. Without mercy or reason. I just ki I killed just for myself. I do regret the fact that I killed someone. But more importantly, the person I killed was you, and so... It's a lie that it's alright if she's alive. It's a, it's a fact that I killed her. It's the ultimate violation, the greatest violence possible. So you can get your revenge on me. I thought it was only natural you'd be here to get revenge. I hang my head mumbling like I'm confessing to someone. I see. Hmm. You're not a bad person. She smiles. Despite calling herself a vampire, she has a very honest face. I've decided. I'm gonna make you help me. Huh? Help her? What is she talking about? Hey, what do you mean by helping you? It's simple. I'm gonna get you to help me deal with the vampire which took root in this town. Hold on, I'm getting more and more confused. Dealing with vampires? But you're a... Oh, no, no. I'm a vampire. But the vampire in this town is different. Is a different kind altogether. You live here, don't you? Then you should know about the murders that have been occurring lately, right? Yeah, quite a few people have been killed. Hey, wait! I remember now. Come to think of it, all the killer's victims had their blood extracted or something, didn't they? Don't tell me that. Exactly. Even the news is saying stuff like the work of a vampire, right? It's a funny thing. They obviously know what kind of creature is doing it, but no one is going around trying to vanquish it. That's why I've got no choice but to do it for them. Wait, but vampires don't exist. <laughs> saying that to a vampire is insanity. She lowers her brows in annoyance. Oh, that's right. It's an unidentified person standing in front of me claiming to be a vampire. I don't really understand, but you're saying, but, but what you're saying is that you're here in this town to exterminate vampires, right? That's right. But before I could, I was attacked and killed by some unknown killer. Yeah, that really got me. I was a perfect surprise attack and I was cut to yeah, that really got me. It was a perfect surprise attack and I was cut into 17 pieces without a chance to do anything. Ah, uh, I see. She must mean me. That's right. Until I was fully recovered like this, I was really planning to kill you, you know? That's the first time anyone's embarrassed me like that. And it took about 80% of my power to fully recover. But more importantly, it really, really hurt. It was so painful I thought I was gonna go crazy. However, the pain was so great, it restored my sanity. Do you know what it's like experiencing that over and over for a whole night? I don't know. Actually, I don't want to know. So full of hatred, I went out to look for you. I was so worked up that I didn't even care about the vampire, the very reason I'm here. I knew you were a student, so that's why I waited over there for you. I don't get it. If you hated me so much, why are you forgiving me? Let's see. To put it simply, I calmed down after a while. I already used up a lot of power and I thought it would be more efficient to use you as a shield than to kill you. Hold on. You just said something really bad for me. Huh? Did I say something like that? <laughs> you said you were going to use me as a shield. Of course. I already did forgive you, but that's just my personal feelings. You've got to atone for your murder through actions, not just emotion, right? Well, even if you ask me. What's with you? I can't tell if you're being sincere if, or and when you're I can't tell when you're being sincere and when you're not. Let me repeat it again. You killed me. You probably can't imagine it, but it takes a lot of energy to to regenerate once you've been killed. Well, actually, it wouldn't be a big deal if you had just killed me, but the way you killed me was something I've never seen before. I couldn't heal the wound, so I had no choice but to remake my body parts. That's why it took so much energy to revive. 
I don't think that's a good voice for her. She looks more like... I feel like she would have a more Takemi-like voice. For some reason. Like a confident... Like a, like a confident type of tone to her voice. Instead of the, you know, the Tosaka bitchy tone. Like, like she's yelling at you and, and she's pissed at you. Even though she is pissed. I feel like she'd have a more um, confident and adult tone. Like, hold on. You killed me. No, that's fucking horrible. You killed me. 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 Fuck it. I'm, I'm just sick with this. She looks angry. It seems like she's recalling a forgotten anger while she talks. Anyhow, I'm weak right now. I think I'll be able to recover after two nights, but if the enemy attacks before then, I'll be in danger. That's why for now, I have you be my shield. You'll have me do it? What are you doing deciding everything by yourself? What? This is all your fault to begin with, so isn't that much to be expected? Or are you not sorry after all? She looks straight at me with honest eyes. She She's cooking you. She is 100% in the right here. 100% by the way. 100% by the way. <laughs> uh, this is unfair. Sorry or not, using those eyes is unfair. It's unfair she has such pure eyes like that when she claims to be a vampire. I'm, um, stuck for an answer. I lift my gaze. Huh? What is it? Something odd is there between the gap of the build between the buildings. Hold on. What's that? I get up and walk. I walk to the middle of the alley and I finally realize what it is. A blue colored bird. A crow to be precise. A blue crow. That inauspicious, inauspicious thing I saw two nights ago. Oh man. The girl murmurs. The crow just stares at us. Jeez, thanks to your slowness he found us. The girl looks at the entrance to the alley. Found us? Who? I cast my gaze towards the alley entrance, then... I take a step back, no ski mask, in shock. Before I knew it, a dog had appeared in the narrow path running into the alley. Oh, that is a Call of Duty Hellhound! It has four tough legs and a tense neck like a steel frame. That form, far removed from that of a human, is made solely for hunting. It doesn't need to resort to verbal intimidation. Most humans will become nervous just by looking at that kind of hunting beast. As a fellow life form, it inspires awe and by its dishearteningly superior athletic ability. A black dog. I start to shake. This black dog looking in our direction isn't small like a stray. As big as a German Shepherd or a Doberman, it just stands there menacing at us. The girl says nothing, but looks at the dog with disinterested eyes. Then suddenly the black dog jumps. No, it's running, but with the speed that made it seems like it's jumping. Huh? I can't do anything. The black dog jumps straight from my throat. I can see it. I can see his black body moving towards me, but I don't even have time to think about dodging it. Thud. I feel a shock on my body. I was hit hard from the side. It's not the black dog. It seems the girl pushed me before I could crush my throat. With an easy movement like someone throwing a ball, she hurls me into the wall with just one hand. With a terrific wham, I fall on my rear. Why you? What, what are you doing? Never mind that. Keep your eyes in front. The girl yells. I look, having lost sight of me. Its target, the black dog, bounds towards the wall. Sticking to the wall like a lizard, it jumps again. It bounces from the wall towards me. The dog's path is like black lightning. Hey, back your ugly ass up, bro! Damn, his teeth is clean. Shit. They be brushing the fuck out them pearly whites. It's too fast. I can't react. The dog opens its mouth filled with teeth and saliva. This time it clamps down towards my windpipe. I close my eyes. The dog's teeth sink into my throat. But in that instant, the dog lets out a whelp yelp and releases me. Huh? That's impossible. 
The black dot lets out a scream and leaps straight up. There's nothing there, but nonetheless it flies high into the sky by itself. Just like that, the black dog, after going several meters into the sky, makes a scream and falls back down onto the concrete. No, perhaps more accurately, it was hit into the concrete. What was that? Jeez, you made me waste more of my energy. The girl quietly approaches the black dog. It's crushed against the concrete like a pressed flower. That's quite a mongrel of a familiar. I suppose it was some kind of scout. The black dog liquefies into some kind of tar-like substance and is absorbed into concrete. It melted. No, maybe it's just dissolving. It, it can't be, can it? There's no way K- Oh, no, never mind. It melted. No, maybe it's just dissolving. It can't be, can it? There's no way chaos would be in a place like this. Heaving alongside, she approaches me. Oh? You don't seem to be hurt, so there's no problem. She's mumbling something. My throat, I can still feel the dog's teeth sinking into it. Hey, what was that thing? A familiar of the enemy vampire. We were discovered because you weren't being clear. Discovered? You mean by that enemy vampire you mentioned? Yeah, this isn't good. It looks like I really will need you as a shield now. She said this so casually and with a smile. Y'all gotta see my goaded ass shirt. My goaded ass shirt, nigga, we dice killing. Hold on. I made this myself, by the way. I made this shirt myself. I designed this myself. Like a real nigga. She says it so casually and with a smile. S stop saying such crazy things, you idiot. You saw me. What do you think I can do? You're a lot better off by yourself. Not really. With the power I just used to protect you, I really am empty now. What? What in the world? I'm grateful she helped me just then, but still. I, I, I can't do it. I can't. I don't have the power to drive away something like that. Sorry, but I can't even be a shield. Liar. You killed me. Why would you lie after doing something like that? That was... That was something I don't even understand myself. No, look, I can't do it. I'm just a normal human. I can't help you. Not true. All you have to do is keep watch while I sleep. That's it. You can do that much without any problems, right? That's... She looks straight at me. Somehow those eyes are making me weaker. Nigga, cooperate, bro. You owe her at least that. I... For some reason, I can't decline. I did kill her, after all. It's not. It's my fault she's weak and has to ask others for help. It is my responsibility. Besides, although I've only known her for a little while, she doesn't seem like a bad person. So how about it? Can't a human like you cooperate with a vampire like me? Well, that would be the obvious answer, but... Oh, don't look at me with those eyes. Why is it? It's making me feel overcome with guilt and unable to refuse. But now that I've gotten myself into this mess, I won't be able to sleep at night if I just deny all responsibility. Man, I just know I'm going to regret this. So, yeah. I think I could probably do it. The enemy's a serial killer, right? As a resident of this town, I'd probably be struck with some kind of divine punishment if I refused to help you. Huh? You mean... I'm not going to be your shield, but if it's just being your lookout, I'll do it. I feel disgusted at how stupid I am as soon as those words are out of my mouth. I feel disgusted, but... There's something about her deeply shocked expression that's... Wow! Are you serious? I I'm really a vampire, you know? Hey, listen. Why are you saying all this now, after you've threatened me so much? Ah, hmm. That's true, but... Well, whatever. If you're gonna cooperate with me, then I should be grateful. With a very happy expression on her face, she approaches me as I lie there on my rear, up against the wall. Our contract is established. She extends her hand towards me. Guess I can finally introduce myself now. Ar... 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 
RQI. Call I'm, I'm gonna call her Arc Arc. I'm Arc RQ it RQ it. I'm RQ it. My last name is really long, so just RQ it is fine for now. I'm a true ancestor type vampire. How about you? I heave a heavy sigh at our unprecedented introduction. It's a sigh of resignation. Evidence that I've, I've decided to accept this nonsensical situation. I'm Tono Shiki. Sadly, I'm just your everyday student. I've said it before, but I'm really not going to be much use. Grasping her, Arukai's hand, I stand up. She takes a long, hard look at me, then offers me her hand again. Nice to meet you, Shiki. I'll have you take responsibility for killing me. Arukai grins and ex she extends her left hand. <sighs> there are all sorts of responsibilities in this world, but this is probably the first and last time someone takes responsibility by helping someone they've killed. Damn it, this is seriously messed up. But there's nothing else I can do. I grudgingly extend my left hand and shake hands with a woman in white claiming to be a vampire. Huh? As we walk out of the back alley, she, Arukai, knits her eyebrows and gives me a suspicious look. Hey, Shiki, are you a Christian by any chance? I have no idea what she's talking about. Chris Chan? Uh, no! I mean, I'm Christian. I don't know about Shiki, but I'm Christian. What's with that question all of a sudden? I don't know any girl who's got a name like that. I see. Then I must have misunderstood. After seeming to have made a decision, she turns towards the office district. Okay, let's go. We've got to, we've got to find a safe place for now. Arokai begins walking. Okay. There's no way I can back out now. Sighing, I follow after her. It's a pretty nice room. I'd have no problem spending the night here. Arokai looks around the hotel room. I've got nothing to say for now. My room has probably already been discovered, so let's hide out here for the night. Oh, you don't have to worry about money. I'm rich, so I'll treat you. Speaking cheerfully, Arakai closes the curtains. She also turns off the lights, and the room becomes as dark as night. I sigh. What are you thinking, Arakai? I'm thinking about all sorts of stuff. No, that's not what I mean. I'm asking why you've rented a high-class hotel, not a cheap one and why you rented out the whole top floor. I try to say this, but I stop. Right now, my job is to guard this so-called vampire and nothing more. I'm not gonna ask any useless questions. No, forget it. Do, do whatever you like. You're weird, Chicky. Suddenly getting mad and going silent like, like that? I just don't get you. Arakai lies on the bed, smiling like she's having fun. I'm gonna sleep until the sun sets. You better rest while you have a chance. Vampires don't move about in day. Vampires don't move about in the daytime, so you'll be on guard for real during the night. Do you do you realize you've just said something that completely contradicts your existence? Oh, it's all right. Uh, I, I guess I'm almost at my limit. Good night, Shiki. Wake me up when the sun sets. Hey. Like a machine whose power is cut off, Arukai suddenly falls asleep. <sighs> okay. She's so defenseless. Right now, I could run away if I wanted to. She didn't force me to come with her, after all. I could easily run away now. And I don't have that impulse anymore, but... I ain't even killed you once yet. How was she able to suddenly fall asleep despite that? I look at Arukai's face as she sleeps on the bed. Her plump chest rises and falls. It looks like she's breathing, but her body isn't moving at all. It's like the air around her has stopped. It's so tranquil, even I might stop moving. What a peaceful slumber. A kind of defenselessness as if she has absolute trust in me, even though we've only just met. She's so stupid. She's so stupidly honest, I might start to worry. But aside from that, this is the turning point. This may very well be the point of no return for Tono Shiki. Man, stand on your shit.
Stand on your shit. I did promise after all. We don't break promises. No matter what it was I promised, I can't break it. Arukai is sleeping. Her face is a pale white, like that of a sick person. Arukai said she was weak. She said she was at her limit just a while ago. So I don't think she considered what I could do after when she went to sleep. The room is quiet. We're on the 11th floor, the top floor. Since she rented out the whole floor, there are no other guests here. The only sound is Arukai's breathing. When I see her like this, she really looks nightmarishly beautiful. That white smooth skin and that silky light blonde hair. The soft lines of her body and those long eyelashes that look like swift brush strokes. A perfect body down to even the small details. The like of which I've never seen before. No, to be more precise, the kind I never would have seen in my entire life. Vampire or not, Arukite is a girl. I have to take responsibility for the fact that she's so weak now that she falls asleep instantly like she just did. You have to take responsibility for your own deeds. A part of my childhood education makes an appearance in my head. Sensei even told me, my eyes are strained so they would in turn attract strange things. Then I should be prepared to take responsibility. At the very least, I should keep my promise and protect her for the night. White, the kind you see when you wake up. The color calls some nostalgic memories to mine. A hot summer day, a blue sky and large, large columns of summer clouds. The scenery slowly wavers in the heat. The voice of cicadas, they're crying. The sound of cicadas, they're crying. Chirp. Chirp, 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 chirp. Cicada shells are lying in the clearing. As if the sun is right by my side, the clearing is roasting. A hot midsummer's day, as if the entire world became a frying pan. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. Akihil is crying. Oh, that's crying. I know what the fuck that was. <laughs> that's crying. Akiha, who would always obediently stay close to me, is brimming forth with tears. A child collapsed at her feet, soaked in blood, killed. The corpse of a child about my age. A cast-off cicada shell. My two hands are red with the blood of that collapsed child. The fuck? Shiki! The adults are coming. The fallen child is still dead. The adults are yelling. Did you kill him? That dream. A dream I have forgotten even in my memories. I feel like I remember. Shiki. Hey, wake up. The sun's already set. Someone is shaking me. A someone unfamiliar voice and the touch of a cold hand on my shoulder. Uh. Huh? Arukai is standing right in front of me. She's already woken up, so it's pitch black outside. I glance at the clock and it says it's already eight. Huh? It's not eight. I told you to wake me up when the sun went down and you'd go and you go fall asleep? Crap. Sorry, I was feeling out of it. I don't remember when I fell asleep, but I'm sure it was while I was staring at Arukai's sleeping face. Jeez. You lose your qualification as a bodyguard like that. If the enemy had attacked when we were both sleeping, we could have both died, you know? I said I was sorry. Besides, you said it was safe during the daytime. I can't say that for sure. Familiars like the one we saw this morning could have come for us. Arukite is angry. Well, she's got a right to be. I've got no right to talk when I, the bodyguard, dozed off while she was sleeping. And besides, I'm a vampire, you know? How can you just sleep there without feeling any danger? I don't want you to be afraid for no reason, but it'd be nice if you were at least tense enough not to sleep. I take that back. Arokai doesn't seem to care that I didn't do my job as a bodyguard. She just doesn't seem to like, like the fact that I fell asleep. I can move my body a little better and wake up, only to, I can move my body a little better and wake up, only to find you sleeping there happily. 
you look so vulnerable. I was seriously starting to feel uneasy that I might not have the dignity befitting of a vampire. Well, I don't think she has much dignity. You were just as vulnerable yourself. I killed you once before, remember? You can't guarantee I won't do it again, can you? Ah! Arakad gives a surprised look as if she only just re realized it. Now that you mention it, you're right. I wonder why I did that. <laughs> I guess I just had complete confidence in you since we spoke in the alley. Well, saying that doesn't make me feel bad for her. Okay. Since you trust me so much, I'll try my best. So, should I just keep watch from now on? Yeah, until sunrise tomorrow. I can't leave the room, so be on guard if someone comes up to this floor. Be on guard, huh? Being on guard is gonna do me no good if one of those black dogs from this morning comes for us. I let out a sigh. As expected, this is too heavy a role for me. Let me ask you something. Was the black dog that attacked us this morning something your enemy sent out? I don't think so. It was probably for surveillance. His patrol route happens to pass by where you and I were talking, and it seems my presence was revealed as a result. Revealed to your enemy. That's right. If I'd been in perfect condition, it would actually save me some time. But right now, it's the opposite. If I were attacked now, I'd be the one annihilated. That's why I have to hide out and hide out like this until my power returns. Arukai's enemy. In other words, the serial killer who's been causing the stir in this town, a vampire. Arukai, I want to ask you something. Will you answer my question? I don't mind talking. But why are you being so formal all of a sudden? Yeah, I haven't asked you the most important thing yet. So what's your ultimate objective here? Me? I'm here to hunt down the vampire. Killing vampires is my duty. Yeah, I do remember you saying something like that before. But you're a vampire, right? What? You still don't believe me? No, I believe you. I believe you so much it hurts. I'm asking why you, a vampire, claim to be doing something as odd as killing other vampires. Oh. You don't like the idea of beings from the same species killing each other? The act of killing doesn't exactly make my list of favorite things, but she is right. I'm not comfortable with the idea of vampires killing vampires. No, it's just that I can't really imagine something like that happening. Vampires drain the blood of humans, right? So they should be killing humans, not other vampires. Drinking blood and killing are, two, are different things. Well, even so, I know what you're trying to say. You think beings from the same species should help each other out, right? But vampires can still be in the same species can be in the same species and still and still be different life forms. That's why they don't really have what you humans call camaraderie. And you're saying something makes you different from the vampire you're hunting. That's right. The one I'm after is a human vampire. Just like you stereotypical just like the stereotypical vampire from you humans folklore. He kills humans by draining their blood, turning them into the dead and uses them to increase his power and influence. That's the sort of vampire I hunt. The one lurking in this town is that sort of old style vampire. That sort of vampire. Seems like there are different types. Don't tell me you want me to be a shield so you can get this guy. Yeah, that was my original intent. But after talking to you, I've changed my mind. You see, at first I thought you were someone from the church. So I thought you might have had information about the location of the enemy. But you turned out to be a perfectly ordinary person. You didn't even know about vampires, let alone the location of the enemy's coffin. Woo! For a second, I thought she hated Christians. You know, I wouldn't have let that get to me. But it, it, you know, but it just feels a little bit better knowing, like you know, she 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 ain't got nothing against me. Hold on. Yeah, come to think of it, there's no way they send an exorcist to the far east secular country like this one. I guess I didn't put enough thought into this. Arakai thinks aloud. Her conversation derails and I'm feeling a little left out. I don't follow you at all, Arakai. Uh, uh, hold on a moment. Let's see, how should I explain this? With that, Arakai's gaze begins drifting. She doesn't seem used to holding a conversation, antisocial fuck. Don't worry about it and just explain everything about the current situation. I don't understand any of this, but I might be able to see the general gist of things. Really? Thanks, Shiki. 
You don't have to thank me. Just keep talking. Arakai nods obediently. Basically, the vampire in this town is an old style vampire. He himself reigns as the lord and releases the dead he made into the city. By doing so, he increases his power bit by bit. The typical vampire in that he drains the blood of humans and those humans become vampires themselves. He's not very powerful right now as he doesn't have that many dead serving him, but as the victims increase, so does his power. It would be best to destroy the main body before that happens, but I haven't found where he sleeps yet. He's hidden so well right now I can't even feel his presence. Even so, it's easy to take care of things once I find it, but I don't have any clues whatsoever, so I know choose but to walk around town during the day to investigate. But then I suddenly got attacked by a passing killer, and now I'm temporarily weaker than the enemy vampire. Arakai shoots me a cold look. I guess she wants me to say something to the passing killer. I see. I kind of understand the situation now. So in other words, some evil monster is our base in this town, and you're here to eliminate them. Since you don't know where they were, you went looking for them, and that's when I, uh, killed you. So now you're weakened and hiding out while you recover, is that about right? To put it simply, I think so. Then, next is the main topic. Next is the main topic. You casually call yourself a vampire, but I still don't really understand that term. It's obvious you're not human, that much I can see, but I don't get the feeling that you're a vampire either. That's true. I'm a little different from the type of vampire you know about. Indeed. I hadn't even I hadn't considered that vampires even existed at all, let alone a vampire like you. So what makes you different? Arukai thinks. Yeah, I, I suppose it might be helpful to teach you a bit about us. Alright. Then the first period's lessons will be Vampires 101. Okay, but what's with Vampires 101? You're an amateur at this, so we gotta start with the basics, right? That's why I'm gonna start teaching from the very beginning. Oh, okay, whatever. Just keep it short. Well, I'll try my best. It really does seem like she's not used to talking. Well, we've got lots of time, so for now, I guess I'll listen to Arakai without complaint. Although we're typically called vampires, we're divided into two main categories. Those who are vampires from the start and those who became vampires. The former are called true ancestors, the latter are called dead apostles. The ones you call vampires are the dead apostles. They drain the blood of humans and turn them into their slaves. They're weak against sunlight and you can vanquish them with the baptism ritual. Our enemy is one of these dead apostles. It's gone from my enemy to our enemy. Well, I don't mind. She's not wrong considering the situation I'm in now. Huh. So you're saying these dead apostles aren't vampires from the start. What do you mean by that? Dead apostles were once humans. They've already attained immortality through magic or had their blood sucked by one of the true ancestors. Either way, the ones that become vampires become immortal even though it's in perfect immortality. Those who are vampires from the beginning and humans who became vampires. What is this? I get the feeling there's a kind of a huge contradiction to all this. It feels like some important fundamental is missing somewhere in this theory. Hey, Shiki, how much do you know about vampire folklore? Let's see, just the usual stuff. They suck the blood of virgins, they can bind people just by looking at them, turn into mist and wolves, just the usual stuff you hear about. I have never heard about vampires turning into fucking wolves. Thought it was bats. Yeah, that's pretty much all true. They drain the blood of virgins because one's blood cells are more pure before one has exchanged bodily fluids with, another, with others. That makes virgins most suitable for repairing the vampire's own degenerating genes. The dead apostles, the ones that became vampires, have imperfect immortality. As they became immortal, they won't die from old age. However, they need to replenish their energy frequently or they'll disappear. All living creatures need nutrients to be able to move, right? It's the same thing. It's just that vampires don't die from age as long as they take in the nutrients. The dead apostles suck blood because they needed to stay alive. Immortal immortality is a strain on their originally human bodies. The genes that compose their bodies are different. When they become vampires, they need to degenerate. They begin to degenerate at an incredible rate. 
To make up for that, they must drain the blood of others in order to absorb genetic information and stabilize their own bodies. To a vampire, drinking blood is not like eating, but it's the minimum requirement to, for them to continue to exist. This sounds complex and long. I can't follow the logic, but Arakai nonetheless continues speaking. So moving on, the ability to bind somebody with just a look is a type of mystic eyes. Eyes and words are both common types of magic circuits, so there are many vampires who have mystic eyes. Magic circuits. Is this fucking fate? The hell? Uh, I guess it would make sense to be within the same universe. We usually possess the mystic eyes of enchantment. We don't enchant people by looking at them, rather we enchant those who look into our eyes. A powerful vampire using mystic eyes can impose his own will into the brain of another and completely dominate their thoughts, but the mystic eyes of the dead apostles don't have that much power. What you call, what you call turning into mist is really just making a spare body and controlling it via the will. Once a, part ser once a part serves its purpose, you cut the flow of magical energy off the off to energy to the offshoot and naturally it returns to dust. Wolves and other transformations are a byproduct of the vampire's repairing its damaged body from its familiars. For a vampire living a long time, stabilizing their bodies with, the normal, with normal lives is not sufficient. Humans are not fundamentally powerful animals, so it's more effective to repair its one body by absorbing beasts and they surpass the human species in this respect. Vampires who repair their own bodies with beasts can return to those beasts to their previous can return those beasts to their previous forms and use them as familiars when they need to. From what I've heard, there from what I've heard, there's there's even a thousand year old vampire whose body is made up entirely of familiars. They say it contains a lot of beasts within his body or something like that anyway. I think Arakai's getting a little too wrapped up in her own speech. To be honest, I'm not finding this world easy to understand. Yeah, that's about it. It's just an explanation of the very basics, but now you do know what a vampire is, right? Well, I suppose. The reality of Arakai being a vampire begins to feel harder and harder to accept. Now it's my turn. Actually, there's something important I've forgotten to ask you too. What? You're not going to learn anything from me. I'm not a vampire or anything, just an ordinary student. Huh. Then let me ask you this, Shiki. How exactly did you kill me? Huh? <laughs> That's a very valid fucking question. How the hell did you kill her? Huh? I'm asking about the method you used. I'm resisted against stuff like runes and Kabbalah. Kabbalah? The fuck is a Kabbalah? Let me see. I don't damn know. I'm resistant against stuff like runes and Kambala, so those don't work on me. The only things I'm not resistant against is, against is magic I've yet to experience, which is probably limited to the ancient Shinto in this country and the treasures in South America. No, even though not even those could kill me that much. Answer me, Shaky. What kind of occult artifact did you use to incapacitate me to that degree? Occult artifact? What's that? A catalyst which stores ideas and history. Jeez, you've got sacred treasures in this country too, don't you? They usually sell them like staffs and swords, jewels and masks, conceptual weapons that can be used against nature itself. Come on, Shaky! Are you sure you're not someone from one of those fields? What field? I told you, I'm just a student. I don't know anything. That's a lie! There's no way a human who's not even a magus, a, a magus can hurt me. Are you hiding something from me, Shaky? Arakai gives me an angry, cat-like stare. But even if she looks at me like that, I'm not hiding in- Oh, shit! I am hiding something! Actually, there's one thing. I'm not sure whether it's relevant, but... Arakai is still staring at me. Doesn't seem like I'll be able to keep quiet about it. Alright, I'll tell you, but how should I put this? I can see these lines that can be used to cut things. Huh? Oh. She's stunned. She should be. Normally, I don't think anyone will believe a story like this. What do you mean? Arakad asks in a serious tone. She's not exactly normal. I should have known she would defy my expectations in a good way. I mean, I, I see these lines where things can be cut. Like living things on the ground, living things, the ground, anything touchable. It's like a black line and I can, I can cut things clean 
when I let anything sharp through it. Does that mean anything to you? It's convenient to be able to cut steel with a knife and all, but it's not like I can cut it wherever, anywhere I like. I can only cut things where I can see the lines. And when I cut you, well, I, I just... Well, you can just cut a girl's skin with just a knife, right? Arukai's eyes are serious as she glances at me. Those wild eyes that I've only seen once before. She's about... She looks like she's gonna murder me. A gaze that could stop my breathing. I see. I thought that mystic guys of death perception only existed in fairy tales. But I guess there is someone who can use them. A mutated monster like you. What? I don't think a monster can call me. I don't think a vampire can call me a monster. A monster is a monster. There isn't anyone, even amongst us, with mystic eyes who can see death, see the death of things. See the death of things. Arakai nods in affirmation with an in inimical gaze. A circuit must have opened in your eyes, Shiki. Were you born with eyes like that? No. They became like this a long time ago, but I wasn't born with them. But you must have had at least one near-death experience at some point, right? What? It's true. Eight years ago, I got into an accident where I almost died. Just as I suspected. You had the Latin ability, but that must have been the trigger. The mystic eyes of death perception, huh? Yes, with those, you could definitely kill even me. With a small sigh, Arakai's eyes returned to normal. Arukai, do you know something about these lines? Not to the extent you would, but I do have some information. What you see is the end of all things, the point where things die easily. To put it simply, the time of death for everything in existence, that is, death itself. I do, I remember now, that time when Sensei gave me these glasses, she had told me something similar to what Arukai said. But there's a subtle difference to what Sensei said and what Arakai said. What I'm seeing are only lines, and not something as disturbing as death. What are you saying? What I see are just the lines where things can be cut. I'm telling you, those lines are the death of the object. Listen, Shiki. Everything in existence has an end. There are differences to win, but it's an end nonetheless. Death does not arrive. It is already contained within the object at its creation, and is bound to happen someday. That is what's called the principle of ca causality. You've heard of that before, right? As long as something has an origin, it must have an end. When it will, when it will end is determined from this beginning. That is so-called time of death. So as it already exists from the beginning, it's not impossible for one to see it with their eyes, given that they can comprehend the concept of the time of death and they have an appropriate circuit in their brain and eyes. That's the truth behind the lines you see. It's nothing more, this is nothing more than a general concept, but if I were to theorize, I would say that they are the weakest parts of the joints between the molecules and something, or perhaps a pre-designated pre pre -designate, pre switch within a general makeup that activates the death of that object. Uh, but that doesn't really make sense, huh? I, I, I can't I can't see them so I can't say for sure but the lines aren't all you can see are they I would think there would be points more than lines ah that's right when I first saw Arukai when I wasn't myself when I took off my glasses I could see the usual scribbles and black points where the scribbles seemed to flow from there were it only happened that one time but definitely I saw black points there were several on your body and the black lines flowed between them, joining them up. If I had to make an analogy, I would say they were like blood vessels. I see. The lines where things die easily and death itself, huh? I'm surprised you've stayed alive until now like this. You must have a very tranquil heart shaking. Arakai says this philosophically. In my own way, I understand what she's saying, but I don't want to believe any of it. What? There's no way that sort of thing exists, let alone me being able to see it. Well, you are seeing it. Usually when you cut a living being's neck, they die. This means it stops because you've cut it. Conversely, you can say that if you can't cut something's neck, it won't die. Ah, uh, this is about me, so just consider it an exception. 
But in your case, like... But in your case, you can ignore the cause. Even against that which is immune to all external effects, you kill first. What is killed then becomes dead. It's not that it stopped because you cut it, but in your case, you stopped the object and as a result, it is cut. See? What else can I call you but a monster? You may just call them lines which something can be cut, but those eyes are more special than, than those possessed by any other user in superna supernatural power in history. You, Shiki, have the eyes that can kill anything, just like death itself. I'm at a loss for words. If that really is what I see, just like Arakite is saying, those black lines really are the time of death for all things. Then everything around me is filled with death. So what? If it's all as you say, I should be able to kill even you. Really? Then let's try it. Arakite opens the curtains. The lights are off. The only illumination is the faint moonlight coming in through the window. Come on, it's alright. Try it, seriously. Uh, wait, could it be you can't see them with those glasses on? Are, are you sure about this? I take my glasses off, only to see the lines, of course. At the same time, the rose begins to rise with the black lines. Outside the window, the moon is white. They're difficult to see in the daytime due to the strong sunlight, but under the faint moonlight, I can even see the glow coming from the lines. Amidst them, the lines on Arakai's body are very thin. If I don't concentrate, I'll lose, si I'll lose sight of them altogether. Ah. If I hadn't been killed by you, I don't think you'd be able to see any- If I hadn't been killed by you, I don't think you'd be able to see any at all, but right now you can probably see them. You see, although I have no time of times of death during the night, some do appear during the day. You can kill me because you could kill me because it was during daytime. But you can see my time of death during nighttime now because I've used up a lot of energy to regenerate myself. In other words, I've lost my immortality. So can you cut the lines on your body? So can you cut the lines on your body, Shiki? Let's see. I think I probably could since the lines are there, but I don't think I could do it so briskly and without hesitation like that time before. I think it'd be hard. The lines keep fading in and out, so I probably couldn't do it unless you're sleeping. You can't, right? That's your biggest weak point. No matter how many deaths you can see, you need to trace the line with your own hands. No matter how weak I am right now, my athletic ability isn't so low that I'd be caught by you. I see. Come to think of it, I can't catch agile animals. That means I can't touch their bodies. In other words, even if I can see the lines, I can't kill anything that moves. Ow! I feel a stab of pain run through my head. Looking at the lions gives me a headache, just like it did when I was a child. I put on my glasses and the world returns to normal. Arakai is staring intently at me. What? There's something else? No, that's not it. You can't see the lines if you put those glasses on? Yeah, I got them from someone a long time ago, when my eyes first became like this. I'm only using the lenses now, but thanks to them, I can lead a normal life. Yes, I see. No matter how strong a mind you may have, your only choices when faced with death all the time would be to put would be to put out your eyes or go mad. Saying that, Arakad comes closer. Hey, can I take a look at them? No, these are important to me. I'm not handing them over to you. Come on, I'm not going to break them. I'm just going to look at them. Arakai creeps closer. I get the feeling she wouldn't be adverse to getting them by force. I say let's just trust her, bro. Just just for a little bit. Arakai doesn't look like she's gonna give up. Fine. Give them back as soon as you're done looking. I hand her my glasses. Arakai stares intently at the glasses, then looks at me with frightening eyes. Shiki, is the person who made these glasses in this city right now? I don't think she is. It's been eight years and it seemed like she was only here for a week. I see. That's good. I don't have to deal with more, well, it's probably not safer to deal with Blue in the first place anyway. Arakad retreats to her thoughts. Arakad, you know Sensei- 
I mean, the person who made these glasses? I know her, a sorceress. She's one of only four of her kind. These glasses are truly a masterpiece. Even I can't break them. Arokai's face grows even more serious. Wait, you were gonna break them? Huh? D did I say that part out loud? I, I fucking knew it! You're gonna break them after all! I retrieved the glasses from Arakai. Jeez. You're the one who said I couldn't stay sane without these glasses? Or do you want me to go crazy? That's not what I meant. I just didn't like how you treasured them so much. <laughs> you asshole! <laughs> Jeez, somebody. Tell me how a mind like hers works. It's true my memories of sen Sensei are precious to me. But more importantly, I can't live without them. If I were to see the lions 24-7, I think I'd die from a headache before I went mad. Hmm. I suppose there must be a strain on your brain for being able to see death. Yeah, there's definitely some kind of reason for those eyes of yours, but this is all I can tell for now. If we get the chance later, I'll go over it in a little more detail. That's alright. I'm not in the long stories anyway. Is that so? Personally, I enjoy talking to other people. Arakai gives a carefree laugh. It really does seem like she enjoys doing nothing more than talking. Night descends. Arakai sits on the bed and we both stare absentmindedly at the clock. It's past four in the morning. About an hour until dawn. Just one more hour? Nothing out of the ordinary happened until now and Arakai shows no signs of tension. We're surrounded by complete tranquility. Somehow I'm beginning to believe that tonight might just end like this. Hey Shiki. Arakai calls me again. What? I don't have anything else to talk about. Really? But it's such a waste not to talk now that we're in a situation like this. Listen, how many hours do you think I've had to put up with your nonsense talking? Six hours. That's making me more tired than keeping watch. Arakai gives me a dissatisfied glare. That's right. For some reason, Arakai has been talking to me for six hours straight. I told her she should sleep if she's feeling weak, but she replied with it's more fun to talk. So in the end, we ended up facing each other and talking the whole time. <sighs> I just don't know what she's thinking. To top it off, I'm hungry. Come to think of it, my last meal was breakfast, so I haven't eaten anything for the whole day. Why don't you eat something if you're hungry? We're in a fancy hotel after all, so you can call room service. That's okay. I lose my sense of tension if I fill my stomach now. More importantly, shouldn't you be getting something to eat? You're weakened, but you aren't sleeping, so you should at least be eat getting something to eat. If you're not going to eat, then neither am I. Normal food is meaningful in its own way, but it's boring to eat by myself. Normal food. There's nothing normal or special about... Ah, wait. Arakai is a vampire. I suppose to her, food would mean drinking someone's blood. Or is there... I guess being a vampire, you wouldn't normally usually consume much except blood? She doesn't look like it, but Arakai is a vampire. She says vampires need the blood of humans to survive. And just how many people has she drained blood from and how many people has she killed before? I sneak a quick glance at her face. I can't imagine. Even though I know she's a vampire, for some reason I can't imagine her sucking anyone's blood. What? Is there something wrong with my face? Something on my face? She meets my gaze and I quickly look away. Arakai continues to stare at me and then gives a laugh of comprehension. Are you curious? About what? About how many people I've sucked blood from. Oh shit. She's completely read my mind. Arakai's smile grows even wider and I don't like it. Well, of course I'm curious. I am helping you, so if I, if I don't know, I won't have any idea of when you might have a change of heart and try to attack me. That would really be a problem. I see, I see. Well then, here's a question. How many people's blood have I sucked on so far? She bounces lightly up from the bed and walks to the window. How many people? That's... Arakai gives a cheerful smile and silently looks in my direction with an air of delight. Damn, it is obvious she's trying to provoke me. Fine, I'll answer. Let's see, it has to be... In the hundreds? Sorry, you're off. Then in the thousands? Nope, that's wrong too. Arakai laughs like it's so funny. 
Somehow this feels really frustrating. Damn! Then, well, I doubt it's the case, but in the in the tens. That's wrong, too. Oh, really? Tens, hundreds, thousands? Do you really see me as that sort of person? That's so mean. That would make me indiscriminate. Am I wrong? Vam am I wrong? Vampires are indiscriminate, aren't they? Even humans get hungry merely by being alive, so... And when it's a matter of life and death for you, you wouldn't be picky either. Yes, that's true, but... I haven't tasted blood in these last 800 years. Nor have I ever killed an ordinary human. Huh? Wait, is that true? It's the truth. After all, I'm afraid of sucking blood. Huh? Afraid of sucking blood? You've got to be kidding, right? A vampire that's afraid of sucking blood. Why? I suppose I'm a coward. That's why I'm a failure as a vampire. Arakai grumbles as she looks up at the night sky from the, from the window. She stays like that for a long time, continuing to look up at the sky. Her white back looks vague, hazed over, as if, she, as if she was merely an illusion. I see a failure. I whisper and I feel relieved. Somehow that makes me happy. Of course, it's only natural to be relieved because now I know the person that's standing before me isn't some kind of vicious evil being. But now, if I were to believe what she says, I won't be killed by her at random. So I'm safe. I'm safe. But I feel that that's not the only reason I'm relieved. Damn it, what's wrong with me? Being relieved over something like this. How can I be happy over something like Arukai being a failure? Ah. Suddenly I feel a faint dizziness. Shiki, what's wrong? You're sweating an awful lot. No, it's just a twinge of pain in my head. I realized something with a shock as I reply to Arukai. The window behind Arukai, beyond the glass within the city street still sunken in the darkness of night, a blue crow is looking in my direction. That's... I can do no more to stare at its dim figure through the window. Arukai turns towards the window too. <laughs> Indeed, I have finally found you, Princess of the True Ancestors. From somewhere, a force of will fills the room. Arukai's eyes are full of enmity. Outside the window, the crow gives a loud, high-pitched scream. This is it! I am heading there right now! The blue crow flies off. All that remains is the dark of night and the white moon. Suddenly, BOOM! With the heavy noise, the room shakes violently. No, to be more precise, the entire hotel shook from that impact. What the hell? I get up from the bed. Arukai is silent, biting her lip with a vexed expression. Arukai, that's shaking just now. She doesn't answer. Say something! That wasn't an earthquake, was it? If I had to guess, it felt more like someone had driven a large dump truck into the hotel lobby at full speed. It was that kind of impact. Arakai! She doesn't answer. If I listen closely, I can hear noises from downstairs. Arakai's face is grave. She says she was powerless right now. That's probably why she's not saying anything. Only time passes by. Two minutes. It's been two minutes after the impact, but the hotel is awfully quiet. Arakai remains silent and still. Just biting her lip as if withstanding something. I can see a trail of red blood slowly flowing down from her lip. Okay, this looks like it's about to start back up into something crazy, and I'm tired as fuck, and I need like a break, all right? So I'm gonna take a quick little break, you know? Maybe take care of something that I need to do today, and I'll be right back on it. Put a bad bitch with some pretty toes in front of me, and I'm gonna get to licking. That's some real shit. All right, I'm back. I literally like left, ate food. Washed my grandmother's truck, took a shower, and now I'm back. Uh, I hope this finishes before my grandma gets home. Arukai. Is she worried? Frustrated? She remains still, almost as if she's embracing herself, bearing with something. She says she wouldn't leave the room. Then, what am I here for? Don't, don't go out and check. No, don't go out and check. You'll get, you'll die. I should, I'll stay inside the room for now and keep watch. As long as Arukai is unable to move, blindly going outside would be dangerous. 
Gripping the knife in one hand, I hold my breath. Arukaid is silent too. She looks like she's being careful of what's around her. The floor below is being noisy. Perhaps the shock woke up the guests and maybe they're complaining to the hotel people. It's still four in the morning, but even so, the noise is as loud as that of a festival. Even that falls silent a few minutes later. The noise disappears. A sickening silence. The lights go out. At the same time, the sound of countless things hitting the door. Are you prepared, Shiki? Arakaid whispers in the dark. Prepared for what? I don't even have to ask her. Then why did you ask, dumbass? The fuck is this horror movie? If remaining in here was a mistake, then that question was also a mistake. I turn towards the door at the sound of it breaking. No sound escapes from my mouth. As I turn around, bright white teeth fill my vision. Like a giant maw capable of consuming me whole, somehow I was, I'm able to calmly tell it's the jaws of a shark. Fresh blood spills everywhere. Okay. With the thump, what remains of my body falls to the floor. What falls is my head. Everything below my face has been consumed in one bite. That is the last scene I ever see. All right, so fuck this game, right? Will you take Seal Sensei's lesson? I guess so. I, I guess this is like the Tiger Dojo. Teach me, Seal Sensei. Bonjour. This corner is for the unlucky Tano who easily ended up in the dead end again. It is time for Teach Me Seal Sensei. Now we will start second period. This time we will present the first Shakes and Shivers Animal Land from the series that gives detailed observation of wild animals. The fuck is that? The fuck is that? Sensei, I have a question before that. That name sounds really stupid. In Japanese, you can read your name as sh sh Shiel. Shiel. Question denied. Now then, Tono, I think it's good to be prudent, but this time it seems, like to, it seems to have backfired. Basically, you are a hero, so a little recklessness will be forgiven. It will be forgiven, but in a case with an absurd animal like a shark, I guess you couldn't do much. You'll have to abandon Archive this time around. Hey! I don't want to hear that from Chiel! Abandon her! Yeah, No violence! Anyhow, please prepare yourself to explore the hotel alone. Inside, you'll find a whole animal kingdom. As the representative of primates, let's go show the wild beasts what we've got. Alright, so I'm gonna say it one more time. Fuck this game. Stupid ass game, man. Fuck this game, bro. Fuck this game. She worried. I should go check in what's happening outside. Alright. I've decided what to do from the very beginning. Taking the knife out of my pocket, I walk up to the door. Shiki! I'm gonna go check things out. Don't leave this room until I come back. I step out into the hallway, shaking off Arukai's look that she wants to say something. No one is in the hall- This is so fucking stupid. No one is in the hallway. I couldn't hear from inside, but the hallway is noisy. It's not that this floor is noisy, rather the noise is coming from beneath my feet. There's some kind of ruckus on the floor below. I can hear the noise of many people talking. I suppose the impact just woke the guests and they're complaining to the hotel. Doesn't look strange so far. I walk down the hallway. The noise from downstairs is like the sound of ocean waves. Noisy. And yet so solitarily and inact- yet so very solitary and inactive. My fingers gripping the knife feel numb. A chill runs over the back of my neck. There's something near my temple. Pain emerges from the back of my eyes. And during it I walk down the hallway. It hurts. My eyes hurt. My head grows heavy and I feel a drifting sensation like I'm about to collapse right here. Yeah, I know what this is. Without a doubt, this is the feeling I get right before I collapse from anemia. Ah, it hurts. It hurts. Unable to withstand it any longer, I remove my glasses. I can see the elevator. A long hallway. It must be more than 10 meters from here to the elevator. And then... With the ding dong, the elevator comes up to the 11th floor. I can see the lines on the elevator door. No, they are, they're too dense. They almost look pitch black. The door opens, the small steel box opens. Inside that box, 
crammed to the point of overflowing his human flesh. Inside that steel box called an elevator, the red meat of humans is ground and pushed in. Inside, two black dogs are voraciously feasting away on something. What? I stopped breathing, like my brain which just froze. My lungs stopped as well. I can't breathe, but that isn't important. My vision turns crimson. With the bubbling sound, blood pours out of the elevator. Amidst the ocean of blood, people, arms, feet, bones, brains, fingers, organs, and other parts. The two black dogs are the only form of life. How is this going to the right end? My very instincts refuse to take in this scene. Down the hallway, two black dogs are picking at the human corpses. If I listen carefully, I can still hear sounds coming from downstairs. If I listen carefully, there are the sounds of gorging, the chewing of meat, cries for help, and the death screams of people which can't even be called words anymore. What is this? Though there's no way to see it, before my eyes is the image of a dozen beasts eating, at, eating the people in the hotel alive. A man, man running down the hallway trying to escape, but the panther-like claws descending from the ceiling slice of Slice open, slice him open from the nose to the back of his head. A girl locking herself in a room crying. But to the lions, a door is no stronger than paper. And within seconds, they demolish it into an unrecognizable shape. Striving madly to be the first ones there, people dashing for the elevator. But within it, the black dogs waiting inside decapitate them the answer the, the door is open. At any rate, there is no exception. Beneath my feet, within this huge box called a hotel, is a scene from hell I can feel down to my very bones. Gah! I feel like throwing up, but I can't do that. If I just stand around and do that, I'll be part of that Red Sea. Ah. Ah, ha, ah, ah. ha. Okay. I resume my breathing. I grit my teeth hard. The dogs inside the elevator notice me. All sounds from below have ceased. Ha. Ah. In other words, there is no longer anyone alive. The two black dogs begin to run, of course towards me, the last prey. Ah, the black dog is coming for me. On their bodies, I can see an infinite number of lines and on their foreheads, the point of death. But even so, my paralyzed mind has not ordered my body to fight or run. The first black dog leaps. Its speed belies all human comparison. It doesn't even take two seconds to cover the 10 meters down the hallway. They open their mouths, mouth filled with fangs so many times sharper than the knife I have, and their arms straight at my throat, accurate and fast. The instant I realize they're drawing upon me, the fangs bite into my throat with a crunch, I die. But that's not right. I can't be killed like by something like this and I refuse to die. The deaths of others would not cause me to hesitate. A hot summer's day. It happened long ago, eight years ago. I've seen something even more terrible. Thrust. I thrust my knife into the forehead of the black dog biting into my neck. My arm moved just before the black dog ripped my throat. It was done so perfectly even for myself. Like a machine whose sole focus is to cut, I plunged the knife into the dog's forehead without any useless or wasted movement because that is where the dog's point was. Normally, even if the brain is destroyed, the muscles try to execute the commands they have received from the brain. The black dog would have ripped through my throat even if I had pierced its head. Well, normally that would happen, but the black dog is dead. Death is a complete stoppage. At the point when I killed it, it lost every form of validity. The first dog falls onto the ground. In its place, the second dog is flying straight at my face. I thrust a knife right into its open mouth. But that was a mistake. This dog's point is on his face, not on his chest. Just stabbing it in the mouth will not kill it. it. Was not in his face, but on its chest. Just stabbing it in the mouth will not kill it. The knife pierces through the dog's mouth and in the back of its head. Naturally, the hand holding the knife still remains in the dog's mouth. Ah, the black dog is still alive. His jaw shuts. The joints between my arm and the hand holding the knife is bitten, about to be ripped apart. Proper thought returns with the pain. Ah, you have to be kidding me. Is this if I'm just letting him chew through my arm by stabbing him in the mouth? Why you? I try to pull my arm out. The dog's teeth are deep in my arm. It doesn't seem like I can pull it off. More importantly, 
despite being this this black dog, despite having been pierced in the head, it's still it's still filled with life. Even though I lift it after piercing its head, it shakes and lands on top of me. I fall onto the floor. I still can't pull my arm out. The black dog still pierced pierced it in it still pierced in the head, applies more power to its bite. My arm is surely gonna be torn off. I can't believe this. No dog ought to be able to bite anything in that state. You! I feel something wet. I can see blood spilling from the black dog's mouth. Is it the dog's blood leaking from its knife wound in the head? Or is it the blood coming from my arm about to be torn off? To be honest, my head is too messed up to be feeling the pain. So it isn't a big deal which one it is. Let go! I try to wrestle away from the black dog, but it is firmly attached to my arm. I can't escape. I can't run away. If I want to escape, I have no choice but to kill it. I was thinking, right? What if he finds, like, maybe where there's a slash and he just... I know my nails are kind of long. I need to cut them. But he just takes a long nail and just... Right there. Like, will that count? Will that cut? But how? The hand that's biting off is the one holding the knife. I'm on the ground, so supposing I did pull my hand out, the very next instant, the black dog's mouth will be free to bite through my throat. Ah! It's okay. Calm down, Shiki. First, you gotta ex examine the situation well, and then think calmly about it. That's the kind of thinking you've always kept. In that case, I can do something. For example, there's plenty of lines on the back of its head. If I can see the black point on its chest, the way to survive is awfully simple. But I have doubts about executing this plan. No matter how savage and evil a creature is, to do something like kill a panting and gasping creature that's, too al that's so alive this close to me is something I'm hesitant to do. Ugh. The pressure on my arm increases. My entire arm is shortly going to be ripped off in this at this rate. But even so, I just can't seem to do anything so cruel. The red blood drips down onto my face. Going down my forehead, it drips into my eyes. Crimson darkness soaks into the back of my eyes. Red. My consciousness sways and then it's gone. But even so, I can't bring myself to kill a living creature. What hypocrisy. You've killed something much bigger than a mere dog. Yes, that's right. But that time was different. I wasn't sane when it was Arakai. Even when I killed the other black dog just moments ago, that was unrelated to my will. Right now, this is very much my own will. Didn't Sensei say, Shiki? Use his power according to your own will and no one else's? That's why, as myself, right now, I can never take a life for granted. That, too, is hypocrisy. Because long ago, you... Ah, that is a nightmare from my childhood. See? What are you waiting for? It was a hot summer day. Kill or be killed. Before my eyes, the blood-soaked shadow of a boy. You've already hot, hot, red blood on my hands. Haven't you killed someone once before? Ah! I thrust. I don't pull, but rather thrust deeper into the black dog's head. I can hear it yelping right in front of me. I think the black dog is crying out. With my arm in its mouth, I cannot prop it cannot properly cry, but it's crying anyway. I'm sure that's how much it must hurt. I don't care. I plunge the knife in deeper along with my arm. Without a sound, the blade of the knife punches out the back of the black dog's head. It's as if a do the dog has grown a horn. Having split the skull, I sl easily slash through its skin. Blood and brain spray out as the knife completely emerges from the back of his head. Also, the hand gripping the knife travels completely through. <sighs> but even so, the black dog is still alive. Then there's only one thing I have to do. I reach around with the other hand, peeling the knife from my blood-drenched fingers. I grip the knife with my free hand. And just like that, I thrust into the point on the black dog's chest. <sighs> And with that, the black dog dies. Its strength drains from its jaws, and I easily pull my arm back out. Oh, it wasn't torn off after all. I look at my blood-covered arm, no corpse party. There are many teeth marks, but the flesh is almost free of wounds. The blood must have been the black from the black dog when I impaled it through the head. 
The pain from when I was being bitten was really quite trivial, but my fear must have amplified it many times over. <sighs> Lying there on the ground, I look up at the ceiling. My head hurts. The world becomes a patchwork and here and there, I can see the black points of death. My body is freezing, but my mind is burning feverishly. <laughs> right beside me like the corpses of two black dogs. One of my arms is covered in blood and the other clutches a red knife. Also, there are, are quite an uncountable number of dead bodies downstairs. <laughs> All I can do is laugh because this isn't real. There's no way this can be real. At what point did I, with my eyes wide open, start seeing a nightmare? Ding dong. Uh. A terribly, out-of-place, cheerful sound rings out. Damn it, what's with this headache? I stand up, enduring the razor-like pain in my head. Elevator? It seems the sound is another elevator coming up. The door opens. Inside stands a man wearing a black coat. The headache worsens. He's... Yeah, I've seen him before. I'm sure I've seen that man before. Silently, he walks towards me. You! I ready my knife as I glare at him. But he doesn't react at all as he walks towards me. It's as if he doesn't notice me at all. The distance between us shrinks. Just a little more, when there's barely one meter between us, and the man finally seems to notice me. Those bloodshot eyes. The instant I see those eyes, which no human should possess, I lose all freedom to move my body. I thought I killed everyone, but it seems there's still someone left. The man turns and looks at the corpse of the two black dogs. You pieces of filth. If you can't even take care of a scrap of meat, you're unworthy to be part of my body. The man voices his pleasure as he raises his hand. His coat lifts like a mantle, broken. With a splash, the black dog seems to liquefy and disappear into the man's coat. Ah... I can't even scream. Below the man's coat is pure darkness, without even the traces of an outline. All that exists there is a mud-like darkness. The, this is dangerous. This guy is too dangerous. What did he say? Oh man. My instincts sound the alarm wildly in my head, but I can't even lift a finger. The man in the black coat approaches me. It's not good if I should stay here. The unstopping headache grows to an unbearable level, telling me this place is dangerous. Whatever the means, if I don't get out of here soon, I'm going to lose my life. But it's too late. The man is right before me. Those eyes aren't looking at me at all. Feed. He raises one of his arms. Below it lies a chaotic darkness. From there, something huge appears. Womp. The sound of wind. That which appeared from below the man's coat is a crocodile's mouth easily large enough to swallow a man whole. Ah, I'm going to die, right here in this instant, crunched up like a ball of paper. Just as I was convinced of this, someone pulls me back. Clomp. What? I, I can't believe it. Instead of me, the jaws of the crocodile clamp onto the stomach of Arukai, who just pulled me out of the way. Arukai's face contorts in agony. She draws back before she's completely devoured by the crocodile's maw. The man silently watches Arukai. Arukai glares back at him with a pained expression, her midsection stained in red. I can't believe a vampire named Chaos would Oh, I can't believe a vampire named Chaos would play such trivial games. It's like a poorly scripted it's like a poorly scripted nightmare, Chaos. I feel the same way. To catch one of the surviving true ancestors. I never dreamed I would be part of a foolish festival. This is a nightmare for me too. The, na the man named Chaos quietly lowers his arm. The coat returns to his former position and the crocodile's mouth disappears underneath. The man looks only at Arukai, as if he's not concerned at all about me, standing behind her with my knife raised. But what is going on? I have heard that the previous executor could not even scratch you. What kind of mistake is this? 
Right now, your presence is exceedingly weak, even weaker than a mere member of the dead. Were you attacked by the church before I arrived, Arukide Brunstead? Arukide says nothing. The man fixes his emotionless stare on her. I don't understand. There are only a limited number of conceptual weapons capable of harming you. The only people in possession of those are the church's assassins, and I don't think the burial agency would dispatch anyone this far east. The man narrows his eyes slightly as he turns around. Either way, this is most fortunate for me. I shall not ask why you have been weakened. All I'm going to do is claim your head while I have a chance of winning. I hold up my knife, preparing for his attack, but... Having openly stated he was going to take her, her head, the man now disappears toward the elevator. It seems despite this claim, the man in the black coat is now leaving the hallway for the elevator. Huh? Now I've got absolutely no idea what's going on. About that man, the two dogs who attacked me, the nightmare-like reality of the attack in this hotel, none of it! Shiki. Arakai leans on me. It's a terrible wound. Though her stomach stopped bleeding, her face is scrunched up in pain. It happened mere seconds ago. The wound she got from protecting me from that man. Why did you... Yes. I underestimated him slightly. I thought I could help you and then dodge him, but... You did really well, Shiki. I guess the wound I got from you wasn't so trifling after all. Arokai's face, twisted in pain, turns into a small, joking smile. You idiot! I can't watch her any longer. The wound she got was from protecting me, and the reason she got it was because of me, too. There's no place for that stupid smile of hers. Arakai leans onto me and lightly closes her eyes. Hold on, don't close your eyes, you idiot. Get a hold of yourself. You're a vampire, you can't die at night, right? Well, that's true, but it, it seems like I'm at my limit. Well, sorry, but could you take me back to my room? Arakai's weight falls on me. Hold on. That's, if she dies, I'll, hey, I call out to Arukai, who has quietly closed her eyes, and then I can hear her happily breathing in her sleep. <sighs> I shouldn't have bothered worrying. Arukai's only sleeping, telling me to take her back to her room like that. How selfish of her. It really was selfish of her, but there's no helping it in this situation. Besides... If we were to stay in this hotel any longer, I have a feeling we'll be in a lot of trouble. Ugh! The headache won't stop. Guess I have to rest too or I'll faint. Arokai's room? Or, or that place? I've only been there once, but I, rem I definitely remember it. In that case, there's no point in staying here any longer. Carrying Arokai, I decide to quickly leave the hotel. The city is slightly lit up. Fortunately, it's too early in the morning for anyone to be awake, so I get to Arukai's room without being seen. I see, so that's how it is. Then I finally realize why the man left. The streets are, begun, are beginning to become covered with a faint orange light. I guess dawn is breaking already. Fuck! Okay, nigga! Wow, alright, so... Shit. A fuck ton happened this episode. Hey, look, it's, tomorrow is Black Beast 2. All I really gotta say, tomorrow, we gotta kill this nigga. Like, come on. He came in here. He fucked us up. He treated us like we was like, like, like we was irrelevant. We can't let that shit slide. Next episode, we're putting our dick in his mouth and we're making them taste the semen. Uh, wait, oh fuck, that's weird, no. Next episode, we're, we're stabbing him, all right? We're gonna stab him in his point, and he's gonna feel the wrath of a real nigga. Uh, shut the hell up. Peace out, I love y'all. Tap into the next episode, man. Hope y'all enjoyed. This shit is turning 